is, is only very useful to get nice pictures of the lowest level of the um, transistor layer, as you can see over here. So um, after the polishing or etching, um, you have to make pictures of the, of the chips. So at this um, structural rights we are actually working on, um, we still can use um, optical microscopes. So magnific magnification between 500 and, and 2,000. Um, it's what we are using right now. Um, yeah, the interesting part is that every part of um, this process could be done with e equipment that is really cheap. So um, the most expensive part um, over here is a microscope. But um, if you are um, interested in playing around with microchips, um, $1,000 um, shouldn't be too much to, to uh, in invest. Yeah, let, let's um, mention though that this only gets you chips um, up until like five years ago. Everything that's, that's manufactured in a newer technology, you need better than optical microscopes for. Yeah. Um, so if anybody has access to a scanning electron microscope or anything of this um, type, um, we, we definitely need you um, to get involved in, in this hacking to, to take some nice pictures, high resolution at sub-optical um, magnifications. Exactly. Yeah, um, right now, also the, the last chip we, we, was, we were working on was at a structural weight around um, 300 nanometers, and everything below the wavelengths of um, visible light, so everything below 500 nanometers, it's nearly impossible to um, look at with the optical microscope. There are some special kinds of optical microscope called confocal microscopes. Um, the advantage of these confocal microscopes is that they can make sharp pictures of um, each individual layer. As you can see on the right um, side, there are um, the blue one and in, um, is, a, is a top layer, the top um, metal layer. The yellow stripes down there are the second metal layer and down there is a third metal layer. Um, yeah, and if you have only um, two interconnection layers, you don't really need to um, polish to um, that layers if you have a confocal microscope, but they are still more expensive and not very easy to use. Um, as Carson already mentioned, um, below one, uh, 500 nanometers of um, structural weight, you will um, get to other kinds of microscope, for example, the scanner electron microscope, or um, as you can see here, a focused ion beam. Um, um, with this kinds of microscope, you have magnifications up to um, 20,000, 50,000, so there shouldn't be no limit right now to um, have a look at newer chips. But um, also, uh, like the confocal microscope, this um, kind of equipment is really expensive. Um, yeah, next step, if you have the, the pictures of each layer, the single pictures, um, you have to stitch it. Um, the problem is um, with the normal camera, at this um, magnification on the microscope, you will get images, uh, image sizes of around 100 by 100 micrometer. And for a chip of around one square millimeter, we have 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 um, single pictures, sing, single Im images, and they have to um, stitch together. Um, we did it with a um, free tool called um, Hagen. Um, that's a tool from Panorama photog Photography, um, but it was not really easy to handle, so um, Sven wrote a, um, yeah, a re really cool um, program which is doing exactly the stuff which um, Hagen does, just stitching um, pictures together and um, get, loss, uh, get rid of the, of the tilt of the pictures. And yeah. Carsten will show a slight demo. Do you, do you want to show it? I can. Um, yeah, so thanks to Sven Karten for bringing this tool to us. Um, it does what Hacken is supposed to do, only it does it right for our purposes, that is. I'm sure Hagen has its, um, has its user base. Um, so here we're looking at two pictures 
that have um, a slight overlap um, and we want to stitch those together into one picture. Um, so the pictures have to not only be moved on top of each other, but one has to be slightly rotated because you'll never get them perfectly parallel. Um, you start off by setting two control points. Um, so you see this structure over here is the same as this over here, right? So we set a control point uh, at this dot and we'll set it again on this side. Um, slightly adjust it with the arrow keys and we'll move on to the next control point. Should be as far away from the first one. Um, so down here, we see this structure here and here. You guys see that? That this is the same dot? So we click here, we click here, we slightly adjust it. I think this is pretty much perfect. Um, yeah. Um, and it did stitch it. And now I would like to point out to you where it stitched it, but you can't actually see it. Oh, yes, here. So you see this one dot up here? Um, that's where it stitched it together. And you can't see any deviation at all. So this is so much better than the tools we've been using so far. So thanks to Sven for, for creating this for us. This is GPL um, online. The, the URL is at the end of the slides. Moving ahead, should, should I be covering this part? Um, so yeah, this, now moving ahead to the, to the second part of, um, of, the, of the reversing process, the recognizing structures in the, in the images we're taking. Um, let me first point out that um, there, um, a chip is full of patterns, recurring patterns. Um, whenever the same function is used on a chip and there's only very few functions, then the same um, instantiation of this function is pulled from some library. So very similar to assembly code where the same instructions will be occurring over and over again. Um, these are the assembly instructions. So this function, for instance, occurring four times in this image is actually the same function pulled from the library. Um, and wherever the, the structure patterns, the computer can be tremendously helpful in recognizing those. In the case of these gates, we just use face recognition software. We tell it up here, this is a face, um, this is a face, where are other faces in this picture? And it will find all of these. We do that for every single <coughs> logic function and we get a map of where on the chip the logic functions are, right? So that doesn't yet tell us what these logic functions are, but at least we know the families and, and where they're spread out. Um, to find the functions themselves, we have to look into one of these cells and figure out how the transistors are, are connected to each other. To anybody who ever did VLSI design, this is trivially recognizable as a, as a NAND gate, as is this, as is this. They're actually very similar. Um, you, can, you can in each of those see the same setup of the four transistors. If you haven't studied VLSI ever, no worries. Um, these are reoccurring on every chip and we documented um, a couple online already. So no need for you to learn it. Um, if you do come across a new chip though that is slightly different from what we already put online, send it to us, we'll document it and put it online for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about recognizing these structures. Um, basically we are writing the assembly language manual here. As a last step in interpreting um, the, um, the, 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 well, in, in recognizing the structures, now that we have the, 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 the map of where what function is, we need to see how the functions are connected to each other. So in assembly language, the control flow, where, where are things jumping, where, where's data passed along through the registers and so forth. These are just metal stripes that we've been seeing in, in a picture earlier. Um, that are connecting these different logic function blocks. Um, and there are several layers of those and they can be interconnected and it's just a huge web of, of metal connecting blocks. Um, of course, the computer again can help us here tremendously because this is, this is very cumbersome work. Um, and we did implement um, a tool